Okay, 1 Peter chapter 5. We will be looking at verses 10 through 14. When was the last time that you had a conversation with God? Was it this morning? Interesting but challenging question. How important is it to have a conversation with God on a regular basis? We're going to talk about prayer this morning and how important it is to us as believers. Last time we met, we left off in verse 8. So let me get the context for you so that we're not out of context as we teach. Peter said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, we took some time and went into depth on what the enemy wants to do to you and to your family, to your children and even your grandchildren. I encourage you to get the CD. It's that important. If you can't afford the CD, then go online on our website and click on that message in uh, chapter 5, verse 8 of First Peter and listen to the message because it was prophetic in that the enemy wants to destroy you. He wants to kill you and what he wants to do to your children. And yet God has put a, a wall or a hedge before you and the enemy. God is protecting you from what the enemy would want to do to you. And Peter is encouraging us that we have an enemy. And so we need to be in prayer. He says in verse 9, resist him, steadfast in the faith, that is the Christian faith, in Jesus Christ, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and there's no other way to the Father except through him, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. And of course, Peter is writing to a persecuted church at the time, which is suffering uh, great loss and suffering in their faith. They are being challenged in their walk with God. So here we have, in, in verses 10 through 14, Peter's prayer for the elect, that is for those that are born again, new creatures in Christ Jesus, God is called out of the world and into the kingdom of God. Now, how important is prayer? Prayer is vital to every Christian. If you're not praying, you're powerless and you're left to fight your own battles because prayer is your strength. Prayer is your battle. Prayer is your shield of faith, the armor of God. It is the thing that you use to battle the enemy. Prayer is important to us, and we should be praying on a regular basis. We should be praying, hopefully, in the mornings, before we get out of bed, or if we get out of bed, find a spot, and we begin to seek the Lord for that day, asking Him to lead us, to guide us, to protect us, to give us wisdom for the day, to give us power and strength to resist the temptation, to prepare us for an opportunity to share the gospel, to prepare us against temptation, all of the things that we encounter on a regular basis. We should start early in the morning to fight and battle the enemy. And so prayer is vital to our lives as Christians. And if you're not praying, as I said, then you walk into the world without protection. You walk into the world without power, without strength, and usually what you find is you're battling by yourself. And so this is why we battle in these situations and lose. Uh, we're struggling, there's confusion, there, there's lack of strength in dealing with situations. You make the wrong decisions because there's no wisdom from God and there's only your own wisdom because you're not seeking God first for all of those things. The Bible talks a lot about prayer and the importance of prayer. Uh, we saw in this short video here the importance of prayer and how simple prayer, not necessarily a prayer filled with faith, but just obedience to prayer and how it can change the life of an individual who was gone. And, and, and the fact that this individual said that he felt he was in darkness for eternity. I wonder how that feels. Now, I don't know how that feels to be in darkness for eternity. I mean, to describe it is one thing, but to literally experience, I believe, is another. It was William Booth, uh, who was the founder of the Salvation Army, who said that uh, he prayed that God would somehow take every Christian and tie a rope around their foot and dangle them over hell so they'd get an experience of what that would be like. It would change your life if we understood what outer darkness was like. And so this man simply was obedient in prayer and he saved a soul from the pit of hell. 
just by simply praying a prayer that the Lord would resurrect this individual. Paul tells us in Thessalonians 5.17 that we should be praying without ceasing. What does that mean, praying without ceasing? That means constantly in prayer. Always being ready to pray for the situation that you're about ready to go. You don't know what's coming around the corner. How many times have you gone around a corner and surprised something was thrown at you? Some bomb just went off. Something that you wasn't expecting. And so immediately you get into prayer. Father, help me. Lord, give me wisdom. Lord, how do I get out of this situation? Constantly communicating with God on a regular basis. You know that when you start to do that on a regular basis, and I understand that it's difficult at first, but once you do it, it becomes easy. That you find yourself talking to God all day long on every situation, no matter what it is. In your head, usually it's in your head. Hopefully you're not saying it out loud while you're walking down the grocery store. Ah, Lord, ah, you know, because people are going to like, what's wrong with that guy? He's a little crazy. I remember I was working at a job and this one guy just, he, he really loved the Lord. He had his headphones worshiping and he was just like, praise God, hallelujah, you know, just doing his job. Doing, I'm like, Man, that guy is really a fanatic. You know, people look at us uh, as we do those type of things like that. That's crazy. You know, no, under your breath, you know, like Hannah, just praying to the Lord, seeking God for every situation. Also, Jesus told us that there are situations where you're not liked. People will hate you. They'll despise you. Uh, They may even spread gossip rumors about you. And Jesus said, bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. Now, what a concept that is. Because our first reaction to those that want to hurt us is to fight back. How dare you? Oh, yeah, you think that was bad? Wait till I get you. You know, watch what I do to you now. Watch what I say about you. The rumors that will be spread about you. And if we're in prayer constantly, Jesus said, if you're in prayer, then you will pray for your enemies. It's not a concept that we like, but that is the Christian faith, isn't it? That's the challenge. That's the difference from the rest of the world, is that we have this love of God in us that we care more for their lost soul than for their actions. Even though their actions are wrong and hateful and destructive, yet they're lost and they're headed to the pit of hell. And so we need to love them and pray for them that God would save them. In my counseling of of couples, quite often I I encounter situations where couples are constantly arguing. They're constantly battling. Now, I understand that because in my earlier days, I was a very prideful man. Uh, Still, there are some areas that God needs to remove from my life because when I am right, I'm right and I'm not going to step down from being right and there are times where me and my wife argued very you know unpolitely (laughs) we got into it and it's a big battle because I was the man you know and she challenged me she disrespected me she didn't honor me and and sometimes you want to just lash back and I've just learned from experience that that doesn't work and so what I do is I counsel people to pray That when you're in a situation and you and your wife begin to argue, don't argue. Immediately stop, bow your head, and pray. In fact, I even encourage you to tell them, I'm going to pray for you right now. I'm going to pray for me right now. And you just start praying, Lord, give me help to control myself, to not get angry, you know, and you start praying. Now, they're going to do one or two things. They're going to go, oh. You know, like Proverbs, a soft answer turns away wrath. You know, or they're going to really get mad. Oh, you know, praying in front of me. Oh, you're not right. You know, they're going to walk away. So it works, though. It works when you humble yourself and you trust in God that God can take care of the situations. And then you won't be arguing over the toothpaste, whether you squeezed it or rolled it. Because those are the arguments we have. And when you get to be 53 and 55, you realize it wasn't worth it. Who cares if we go to this restaurant or that restaurant? Who cares if she was a little bit late? You know know her. So you expect to sit down and read your Bible while you're waiting for half an hour. You you just expect it. My wife doesn't do that. (laughs) Not all the time. All right, most of the time. You just expect it. It's it's not worth it anymore. You understand that, that that's okay. That life has other things that we need to worry about and battle against. So you pray for your enemy. You pray for those who spitefully use you. 
Jesus said, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Now, there are a lot of temptations out there. Things that entice us, men that entice men to draw them away from their wives. Uh, wives, uh, there are things that entice you and tempt you to draw you away from your husband. And we need to pray and seek the Lord because the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is so weak and we give in to the flesh because it's easier to give in to the flesh. It's easier to argue and to fight than it is to be spiritual and say, let's pray. <clears throat> You know, it's so much easier to do so. But Jesus said we are to do that. We are to pray against temptation. There are a lot of things tempting us. We know what to do. The the Spirit is willing, the Bible says. In other words, the Spirit understands and knows what the right thing to do is. And we know that we should be doing that, but we find that we give in to the flesh because it is the easier thing to do. It is the difficult things that we need to do through prayer. Jesus said, take heed, watch and pray that you do not, that you do, for you do not know when the time is. And boy, today, uh, as we look at what's going on in the world, and one of the latest things is, is Iraq with the, um, the ISA, you know, coming in and just... Hundreds and hundreds of uh, security police officers, men and women, just killing them, wiping them out and taking Iraq over again. And and now our president, uh, from what I heard last, was thinking of putting Iran in charge over them. I'm like, how naive is that? Iran hates Israel. Iraq has a nuclear weapon. You know, they're going to go in there and boom, it's over. The rapture, we're gone. The tribulation begins. And so Jesus encouraged us to pray as we see these things happening. Pray for opportunities to share the gospel with your loved ones before it's too late. Pray that God uses these things for his glory. Pray that we don't get so preoccupied with life and culture and all the things of this world and lust and so forth and that we're busy with the kingdom of God that we belong to. Pray for those things. Paul said in Hebrews 4.16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne room of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. What I find oftentimes is that people um, don't believe God will listen to them. Oh, God will listen to someone else because I can see they love the Lord and they go to church and they're faithful and so I can see God listening to them, but not to me. I don't even want to ask them because that sounds selfish, you know. And yet, Paul tells us that God is not that way at all. God is waiting for us to enter into his throne room of grace and pray, to seek help in time of need for any situation. If you can only imagine this huge castle with these huge doors and and these hallways that are just going up into the sky and soldiers and peoples and crowds and, and they're all focused on the throne and there's this huge throne and there's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the angels are all around him worshiping and praising him and the disciples and, and the Jews and, and everyone focus on him and he's giving counsel and wisdom and understanding And then all of a sudden, here comes you, and you open up those doors. Everybody turns around like, who was that? You know, you kind of walk in there, and everybody knows it's you. You're like, oh, no, did I interrupt something here? You know, and you're walking up to the throne, and everybody stops. The angels stop. People are looking at you. God all of a sudden looks at you. That's what Paul is saying is happening, is that you can enter into the throne room of God and find grace in time of need. God literally says, okay, everybody, quiet. My child wants to hear me. He's asking for something. And I want to listen, and I want to answer him. That's our God. That's how we can approach him. Simply and humbly, knowing that he hears us. I have a a rule with my grandchildren now, but even with my boys when they were younger. Children have a tendency of not fully understanding, respecting their elders and adults and so forth. So they will, they will come in and interrupt your conversations a lot, right? I mean, they just love doing that. It's not that they do it on purpose, though we think they're doing it on purpose. You're having this conversation with an adult, and they come up, Mom, Mom, Dad, Dad, can I? I'm like, quiet, quiet. Hang on. Can't you see I'm talking to someone here? Don't be rude, you know, and we just kind of push them off. And I learned, again, through my uh, reading of 
books by Dobson and and others that we need to put our children first. We need to put little ones first. That little ones have this simple faith and understanding that they can come boldly to their parents or their grandparents or adults and ask for things. And so I always put them first because it takes longer for me to discipline them and tell them how rude they are and how they're disruptive and we're talking here and you're now interrupting our conversation than saying, yes, what is it? Oh, no, go ahead. And they're off because you just answered them that quick. So much easier to do that. And I just learned that, that it's a good thing to do. You do that with your children. That's how God is. He doesn't feel like he's interrupted by you. He's waiting for you to ask. And so Peter is asking God in these closing verses to do his work in the lives of his believers, to perfect them, to establish them, to strengthen them, and even settle them as saints. As believers, we need certain attributes and power to live in this world. Without them, we can't live in this world. We cannot survive. We need these things on a daily basis. And Peter understands that. And so he says, in 10 through 14, listen to his prayer, verse 10. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. She who is in Babylon, elect, together with you, greet you. And so to Mark, my son, greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Peace to who? To those who are in Christ Jesus. And so he's speaking to the believers about God's grace. Speaking on behalf of them that God would work in them. The great work of perfection and establishment and strengthening. He says in verse 10, the God of all grace. The God of all grace. He is the God of all goodness and grace. The word grace basically means favor. God's the source of spiritual comfort and the help of every situation. And so how much more do we need to be in prayer and seeking God in that relationship? Have you received that grace? Is it from God? that you've received it. See, God's unmerited grace is God's riches at Christ's expenses. It is Christ who died on the cross so that we could have favor in the eyes of God. There's a song, a classic song. You all know it. It's called Amazing Grace. It's a pretty amazing song when you listen to the words, you know, especially when it gets to the part about a wretch. You know, how could God save a wretch like me? It's amazing grace when you realize that. In fact, it, it is so popular that even the world will use this song in many of their their, their shows or movies and various things that they, they do. Uh, they kind of uh, water down the truth of what it's really saying from the writer's point of view. But they understand that if there is a God, that he has this amazing grace, and no matter what you do, he can forgive you. And that's basically what the song is talking about. The writer of this song was John Newton. He was an 18th century British slave trader. He had a dramatic faith experience when he was in a storm one day. He literally fell overboard when a part of the ship broke and he called out to God and God saved him. Uh, One of the shipmates actually took a harpoon and harpooned him and then pulled him back aboard. But it changed his life. And from that point on, he took what he learned from his mother, who was a devout Christian, and prayed for him. And he began to apply it and read the scriptures. And in his dealings with slave trading, he continued on with the slave trading for years. It took time for the Lord to reveal to him that slave trading was wrong, first of all. And then he actually became a a fighter against it. And he was a part of the abolishing slave trading completely. Uh, so God totally changed his, his, his view. Now, you've all seen the pictures <clears throat> of slave trainings, if, if not in school you know, or, or movies and so forth, and how they would literally 
uh, transport these men and women and children from Africa to the United States, you know, in various places in Britain and so forth, and how they were sardines, you know, put in the bottom of boats and on layers, and many of them dying from dysentery and other diseases, you know, and by the time they got to America or which wherever their destination was, their mom or their dad could be dead or their children could be dead. And he was a part of all of that. Now, I don't know what it would be like to be a part of that, to see that, to experience the, the, the smell of death on a regular basis on the ocean, knowing that you're making deals with people in Africa and chiefs as they're selling off native tribes to you that they've captured uh, for money and trade and so forth. You know, and then you're taking them over here and selling them to a foreign land to change their lives completely. But he realized that it was all wrong, and when he did, it changed his life at God's grace. And so he wrote the song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, that God could forgive a wretch like him. Now, I'm not that bad compared to him, who probably was a part of a lot of death. And yet, if God could save a wretch like that, then God could save a wretch like this. And that's amazing grace. That's the grace of God. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about that grace. It was the grace that, of God upon David's life. David said this in Second Chronicles 2.6, Who am I that then? And he talked about building the temple. Who am I that I should build the temple, that I should be the one to, to structure this great temple of God? I am nobody. He understood God's grace, that it was only by his grace, by his favor, that he would be able to build the temple. So many times in our pride, we think that we're going to build the kingdom of God. That we're going to support the kingdom of God. When in reality, it's God's grace and favor in our lives that will build the kingdom of God. Through us, if we understand that. Through us. I think that if we understand it, a lot of us would be a lot richer. Because we would not hold on to it. We would give it to the kingdom of God. But because we don't understand it, we don't have as much as we should have for the kingdom of God. And so David understood that grace. He goes on, Peter, who called us eternal glory by Christ Jesus. In other words, the call was divine, that is, believers, and he called us. Uh, The Greek suggests that the word us is not necessarily a good translation. It literally should be you. And so Peter's speaking to them and so saying, he called you divinely into this eternal glory by Christ Jesus, no other means but through Christ Jesus alone. That's speaking of relationship, isn't it? It sure is. Then Peter makes a statement about their suffering in his prayer. He says, after you have suffered a while, now the word a while there means a little, could refer to a duration or a degree of suffering, just depending upon where they were at in that location where the persecution came quickly or whether it was a long duration. But he's saying here, as you're being persecuted, and it may be a while, he said, let God perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Now these words are interesting. Some commentaries didn't put a lot of emphasis on the words. They felt that the fact that Peter was just praying that God would do a work in them, and that's basically what Peter's praying for, but he specifically said some things. He talked about perfection. The idea of perfection conveys the idea of putting things back together. Not necessarily maturity, but it is included. Not purity, though it gets included, but there are parts missing in our lives. And Peter is praying that God would put those parts back together. I have a, uh, a pool as most of you know, who went to the baptism last week. <clears throat> and in this pool, I have what they call a pool vac. And so it saves me time and work because it cleans my pool while I'm not there. It literally is hooked up to the system and it just, it just uh, vacuums the whole you know, pool by itself. It's all over the place. It climbs walls and steps and various things and it's just sucking up debris and you know, cleaning it at all times. Now, it, it gets old though. And so the one that I have now is probably about 10 years old, but I have pieced it back together from time to time um, because it breaks down. Gears go, and so I take it apart, replace the gear, put it all back together, and it runs for uh, another two, three months, and then I replace another part. And right now, it's got these little flaps that are on the side of this pull vac. And these flaps kind of just flap around underwater, and what it does is it kind of 
pushing it up so that it doesn't just stick to the plaster because sometimes it has a tendency of just sticking there and it won't move because the suction is too much. And it's just sticking against the wall like, a, like one of those sucker fishes, you know, just stuck there. These flaps keep it going so it kind of pushes it up and it just moves around because the legs start to move. Well, right now, one of the flaps is gone. I, I looked and it broke and it just fell off. And so it's got one flap. And it's just like going like this, you know, just going around, flapping around and spinning around and it's not cleaning the pool, you know. And it's kind of like us sometimes because we're not in prayer. We're broken pieces and God's trying to put us back together and we're like that one flap in life and we're just kind of just flapping one wing around, you know, and God wants to put the other one on there so that you function properly. And that's what Peter's talking about perfecting us. I'll talk a little bit more about that word. And then establish means to stand firm. But not just stand firm in your own strength, but in the strength of grace, of grace, of God's favor and His power and His strength. That's important to understand. You cannot fight the enemy on your own or with your own wisdom. You need to apply the scriptures to your life and stand upon the sure word of God. Strength denotes the idea of God giving you the strength to bear through these sufferings without wavering in your faith. How do I know when I have God's strength? When you are standing in the Word of God and you are having victory. It's when you're not standing and you're faltering and you're falling apart that you realize, okay, I'm not doing something right here. Either I'm not applying the Word, I'm not in prayer, I'm not believing in God. And you need to change that through prayer. And then settle you or ground you securely, securely to the Lord completely. So what Peter is saying here is in contrast to what the devil's purpose is. And that is to destroy you, right? We saw that. He's a roaring lion. He wants to seek and devour you completely. But Peter's saying that's not what God wants. God wants to perfect you, strengthen you, establish you, settle you. So that you can battle the enemy. Did you guys, uh, those of you that were here last Sunday, did you even think about that message when you went home, what the devil wants to do to you? I really encourage you, get the, get the CD or at least listen online. Um, it's amazing when you think about what the devil would like to do to you personally or to your children. Uh, we need to understand that. And yet God's grace has put a wall on the hedge before us. He, in a sense, that lion has a leash and God will only allow him to go so far. I encourage you to listen to it again and really think about what God has done for you because he has done a lot. God uses these sufferings uh, in our lives to bring about grace. You know, the the question in that video, the, the man said, I don't know why he gave me a second chance. There doesn't have to be a reason because you know what that speaks about? God's grace. Just God having favor on an individual for no reason at all, but just to have favor. That's simple. Sometimes we don't know why we're going through things. And when we come out of those things, we can see simply God's grace. And so we can talk about how gracious God is to get us through these things. He loves His children, and He wants to prepare them to share in His glory. He's preparing you. So when you get to heaven, you, pre- you are prepared to share in the glory that he has awaiting for you. So Peter prays three times uh, that the results would be perfecting, establishing, strengthening, and settle you. Now it's interesting that some translations insert the word himself, make you perfect, establish, and strengthen you. It speaks of God doing the work, and that's grace. It's not you doing the perfecting. You can't put yourself back together again. Now, I know that the world will tell you you can, and you can go to a psychotherapist or psychiatrist, a counselor that will counsel you in how to put yourself back together. There's a problem there. The Bible never talks about counselors and psychotherapists and so forth. There's only one counselor, by the way. You know who that is? The the Holy Spirit, right? Jesus said, I will send you a counselor. And He will counsel you and comfort you and equip you and teach you. He's the Holy Spirit. And there are too many people playing Holy Spirit around here. They think they got the answers and they can put you back together. No, it's the Lord that puts us back together. Peter said, Himself, Himself make you perfect. It's God who does it. 
uh, in the Greek sentence, this pronoun is emphatic and it's placed before the following verbs to signify that it's God's work in your life and no one else's. By the way, if you think that uh, you're going to help someone with their sin or in their growth or in their discipleship, you're not. You can't. You can share with them the scriptures just like I'm sharing with you the scriptures. Boy, if I thought that I could do that, this church would be a lot bigger than what it is. It is the work of God, and that's why it's the size it is, because it's what God wants. That's his purpose for whatever reason, his grace, and so forth. I can't change anybody here. Some of you might even be tuned out right now, <laughs> you know, thinking, when is this over? All right, we've got five minutes before it's done. You know, it's a work of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit takes a hold of you, it's a whole different work. That's the difference uh, today than back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, the Spirit is trying to get a hold of people, but because of the culture, the day that we're living, people are not listening to the Holy Spirit. They're listening to the culture. They're listening to other people and what life should be about instead of what God has said in His Scripture. But when I got saved, you know, and I was watching this with others that were getting saved, there was a revival. The Spirit was moving. Uh, people were getting saved, and they're like, man, what do you want me to do? They were in church every Sunday, every Sunday, not once a month. Today, people think going to church is once a month. Let's go to church. Yeah, I haven't been in three weeks. Yeah, it's about time I go back. You know, it's every day people were in church. And then it was, how can we get involved? You're having an event, we'll be there. We'll help out. You know, it's so interesting. We'll have our agape feast today. Nothing wrong with agape feast. They're, they're wonderful. And it's wonderful to see so many people here fellowshipping and eating together. It's a great thing. But then we'll have our Monday night prayer and there's three people here. Priorities are wrong. You know, throw a concert with some of the latest groups and guess what? You'll be packed out. Packed out. I believe that's, that's a lie of the enemy. Not that worship is wrong. Don't misunderstand me. And, and these musicians and so forth. But I think that the, the direction is being misled by the enemy. We're now more fo focused on these bands and these groups that they're ministering to us instead of the pastor from the pulpit, the word of God. And so we'd rather go to these concerts. I saw the fish videos, the fish at the amphitheater packed out. I mean, they were like from the bottom all the way to the top. The, the, the summer fest, packed out. Go to church? Uh, maybe next Sunday. I'm tired. Went to the concert. We really worship the Lord. Worship is more than just singing and listening to someone sing. Way more than that. And we miss that completely. And I think it's a lie of the enemy. And it's interesting because even worship leaders now are taking the place of pastors in the pulpit. We got a, an email just the other day, and the guy wanted to share his credentials. I just graduated from the school of worship, and I was a leading worship in our class. And I have these acclimates, and the Lord just laid you on my heart, and I was wondering if maybe I could be used of God in your church. You know, and I got excited. I'm like, wow, they called us <laughs> you know, with all these, these credentials and so forth. You know, he wants to come over here. I talked to my son about it, and we were both in agreement. You know, well, let's see where his heart really is. Maybe he really wants to worship the Lord. So I, I emailed him back. We'd love to have you. It'd be wonderful. It'd be great. Why don't you come and come to church and sit for six months and, and just get into the fellowship, get in unity, Let's uh, you know, practice with some of the worship group and see how you do and, and see what God does and create a relationship and, and so forth. Grace. Never heard a word? <laughs> I guess God wasn't calling them that much you know, into this ministry here. Why? Because he wanted to be paid to do it. Nowhere in scripture does it talk about supporting the worship leaders of the church. It says the pastors. That's the priority. God has called pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, not worship leaders. We got the emphasis the wrong way. God is going to strengthen us, perfect us, establish us through the word of God. No other way. In fact, the word perfect there 
in the Greek means perfecting, as I said, putting the pieces back together. And it's the same word that Paul uses in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. What he's saying is that God has given you pastors to put you back together through the word of God so that you can be effective in the ministries that God has called you to. That is how it functions within the government of the body. We used the same word last week when we taught on fathers for Father's Day and how the disciples were mending their nets. They were putting it back together. They were perfecting it. What for? To use them again. Same word. It's amazing when you think about the infinite God of this universe and what he really wants to do about you and me. He wants to put us back together so that we're usable. And this comes through prayer. And so Peter directs his prayer now to God in glory because he got so excited and he says to him, be glory and dominion forever and ever. Hallelujah. I can almost see him you know, shouting. And then he decides that I'm going to write the rest of this letter myself because he probably had uh, Sylvanus write uh, the other part of the letter, but he got excited and he said, by Sylvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him. Now, interesting. Uh, this brother here, we don't, know a lot about Sylvanus, but many of the commentaries tell us that he is Silas, who we find in the book of Acts. He was a co-laborer of Paul. His name means forest. Sylvanus means forest. The word Silas in the Greek means woods or a person of the woods. And so they suggest that it's the same person who is being faithful here. Peter calls him faithful more for a recommendation that this is a man that is faithful. And it's wonderful to find faithful people in the church. You know, the heart of a pastor is to see people come to church because they're called to that ministry. But what we see today is people trying churches until they click at a church, whether it's a friend, whether it's the pastor that's up there speaks the same way or looks the same way or dresses the same way. You know, whatever it is, there's all kinds of reasons. But it's rare to find someone say, I'm going to church because God wants me to go there. And I'm in prayer asking God to lead me there to that church. And if that's where he has me, I am going to be faithful to that church church has nothing to do with the pastor has nothing to do with the people it has to do with me being called to do that that's really the heart of the pastor and i think that's the heart of god because we all have a calling a purpose and god has us in the body of christ at a specific place and we really need to pray that some of you that are visitors today i don't mean no offense of that i don't say you're suggesting you're doing that but if you are you need to pray and say lord where do you want me because so often we go where we want to go. Yeah. <clears throat> I have been to two churches in my life. And the first church that I went to is where God called me, and I stuck it out there no matter what. Yeah. And then the Lord called me to start a church. And I've been here ever since, because this is where God has called me. And there's others that God has called here. And I know that because they're faithful to be here. Randy is one of them. He's a faithful servant to me just like Silas was a faithful servant. When you read the book of Acts, it's interesting that Silas was a part of the leadership. Silas was a part of professing the gospel. Silas was a, a man who had the gifts of the Spirit. He was a prophet of God and would prophetically speak the word of God. There were times where Silas was with Paul and they were being stoned uh, together. Silas was faithful to Paul, to Peter. He was a faithful man. He was committed no matter what. It's what we need. I was talking to a pastor the other day and, and he was sharing with me that uh, this young man has, <clears throat> has made it very clear to him that God has called him there to that church to serve with him. And he said, I am so amazed how like-minded we are. And it feels so nice and it feels so peaceful to know that there's no opposition but there is unity in the same direction. Yeah. And that's what a pastor wants. The opposition comes from the enemy because someone is trying to make a play for a position or a place, you know, or and they don't like the way things are run and they think they should do it this way because if they do it this way, the church will grow. You know, it could be all kinds of reasons, you know. 
instead of just being and backing the leadership. Paul, at one point, Paul even said, hey, give me your belt, tie my arms, and this is how I'm going to go to Rome. I'm going to be bound, and then I'm going to die. And then the other disciples were like, no way, there's no way, we're not going to let that happen. And they were out of line. They didn't understand what, what Paul was saying, but still, they were faithful to him. Okay, we're going to stick it out. We're going to watch it all unfold until the very end when they beheaded him. You think of Moses. How many of you if, if, that had that leader quality uh, would have been with Moses and then all of a sudden Moses brings you to the Red Sea and then you see the dust over there and Pharaoh and his chariots are coming. How many of you would have thought, Moses, you made a bad decision because there's a Red Sea, there they are, we're dead. What kind of leader are you, Moses? I mean, we all would have probably said something like that or at least thought it, you know. Man, Moses, you did all pretty good all the way up until this point. I don't know what happened to you. Did you flip out? You know, the sun get to you? you know? And yet, God's grace and plan and purpose began to unfold when, when Moses says, Lord, what'd you do? <laughs> He's like, Lord, help me. These people think I'm crazy. You know, you brought us here. Now, some of you are saying, did you bring us here to dig graves so we just bury ourselves or what? And he put his staff in the sea divided. And God's grace was revealed. And the fact that Moses was the leader. And, and you could follow him. But that still wasn't good enough. You, you know the story. Uh, Moses went up to the mountain and Korah down there says, where's Moses? He's abandoned you. You know, why don't you guys listen to me? I know what we're doing here. Listen to what I got to say. And so then they divided the whole camp. And what did Moses do? He comes down and he says, hey, I'll tell you what. Korah, you think you're the man? Let's let God choose. Let's draw a line. And tomorrow morning we'll meet together and we'll let God choose. And Moses one more time says, who's with me? If you're with me, come over here. Be faithful. If you're with Korah, stay with him and we'll let God choose. And the men came to Moses, a few, but many of them stayed with Korah. And what happened? The earth opened up and swallowed Korah completely. God really admires faithful men even when they don't understand what is going on. And there's a lot of that. <laughs> we don't understand what is going on. But there's something to be said about faithful men. Now, I'm not faithful. When I look at the Ten Commandments, I don't love God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. I fail so many times. I don't always honor my father and mother. You know, I, sometimes I lie. You know, I'll stretch the story so it makes me look better among my fellow pastors. Yeah, we got 500 people. We only have 60. Yeah. A little stretch there. Well, we could have 500 people. Yeah. I don't go that extreme. You know, I'll, I'll usually go, yeah, we got like 151. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow, that's good. Oh, thank you. I'm okay then. I mean, I'm not a faithful man, but because he's faithful, I want to be faithful. It's a struggle and it's a battle. God is looking for faithful men. Peter continues, says, I've written... To you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which we stand. And so here's that grace again. This is the whole purpose of him writing uh, for the true grace of God in which we stand. If there's a true grace, is there a false grace? Yeah, Jude talks about a false grace. He talks about men who come into the church, verse 4 of Jude. They creep in and they, they turn the grace of God into lasciviousness, a license to sin. And we see a lot of that with Christians. Well, we're under grace today. We're not under the Old Testament law where God says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and God judges you. We're under grace, and so we have a license to sin. I can continue to sin knowing that God will forgive me. I'll continue to live in sin, and God will forgive me. That's not true. That's a license of lasciviousness, and that's what these men were saying. God's grace is so good, continue to live in sin. No, God wants us out of sin. This is what grace is. It's the ability to live a sinless life. He has freed us from sin. That we can say, I will no longer live to sin. I want to get out of that sin and I will, through prayer and strength of the Lord, get out of that sin. That's my hope. That's what true grace is. Don't believe the lie. If you're in sin, you need to get out of sin and obey the Lord and do the right thing. It's what God wants. That's true grace. Then he says, she who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greet you. 
And so does Mark, my son. And so apparently he's either in Babylon, out of Babylon, writing to them. He's saying the church here in Babylon, which is a location. Some, some say it's in Rome or Egypt, that it's a type of Babylon. But it, it doesn't suggest that at all. It was probably literally Babylon that existed at that time. And he's just saying they all greet you. They all miss you. That's brotherly love. He says greet one another with a, with a kiss of love. And so he ends his little epistle here saying, greet one another with a kiss. Uh, kiss each other in the cheek, brotherly love. Now, we don't do that anymore. It's funny how the enemy will take the non-essentials of the scriptures. Non-essentials are those things that really don't matter, like feet washing. It's not something we're commanded to do. You can do it, but we're not commanded to do it. And some churches will do it, and some churches will frown on you because you don't do it. But same with kissing. It's not a doctrine. Jesus didn't say, thou shalt kiss one another with a holy kiss. He never said that. It's a non-essential. And so we don't have to make a big deal out of it. But the enemy will take these non-essentials and he will try to stir things up. You can only imagine what will happen if we begin to kiss one another. If guys would kiss girls and girls would kiss guys. And then you see the younger one is like, whoa, 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 wait, hold off here. The enemy could take a foothold into that stuff and really turn things around. And and that's basically what happened. It was uh, Clement of Alexandra who said, love is judged not in a kiss, but in goodwill. It got to the point that people were thinking, look at how much I love you. Let me kiss you on the cheek. Mm -hmm. See how much I love you? And he was saying, no, that's not what love is because you're kissing them on the cheek, but you're not helping them. You're not giving them when they need that help. You're not sacrificing some of your time. You think kissing them is loving them? No, that's not true. And so they began to make regulations. Okay, men can only kiss men. Now, why is that? Because men started kissing women. Okay, and women can only kiss women. And then finally it just fell by the wayside because it was a non-essential and the enemy tried to get his foothold, divide the church over it, and it's something that you don't have to necessarily do. Today, what do we do? We shake hands kiss we don't do that we used to have an older couple here years ago and they loved to kiss you on the cheek and that took me by surprise the, the guy older guy he was probably in his 60s at the time he I reached my hand out he shakes me pulls me in and gives me a kiss on the cheek i'm like oh man what was that about <laughs> you know like oh and it surprised me because i don't do kissing not as a man you know that's just something i don't like doing it's hard enough for me to even hug somebody you know I, i'm the type of guy i meet you Let's shake hands, okay? Hey, you're all right. I'm all right. There's our distance. Don't get any closer than that. And maybe next week I'll shake hands and then I'll touch your arm. Okay, we're that much of a friend now. You know, then it progresses from the arm to shake hands and, oh, you're at the shoulder now. Okay, we're getting to really know each other. And then maybe one hug arm, you know, and then it's hug, you know. And then now, okay, now we're friends. Now we really have brotherly love. But don't try to kiss me. Because that, that's, you know, I'm still too macho for that. I'm a man. I don't like men kissing me on the cheek even, you know, let alone. He tried on the lips, but I'm like, ah, ah, ah. No, no, I don't go that way. You know, forget that. So. so we just shake hands and we get to know one another. And you'll see that with me. And some of you already know where you're at with me because I just revealed to you <laughs> how I do it. You know? and, 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 you know, and that's on purpose. I do that on purpose, by the way. Because I know people are different. You know, and how they approach people. Some are very, you, you ever get close talkers? You know, they, they like right away they come up to you like, hey, how you doing? I'm like, I'm fine, you know. And if you have to put yourself behind a chair to keep them away from you, because they're just close talkers. You know, other people are like, stay away, you know, and talk to me way over there. And so I'm aware of that. So I always start with a shake and then the arm and the shoulder and then the, and the hug to see where they're at. Some people are still the, the handshakes because they're just that way. And I understand that. But behind all of that, it's, it's the love. And that's what Peter's getting at. Love one another. Love one another. That's important. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, I, I pray that you would ask him into your heart this morning. Jesus is available to you. He loves you so much. <clears throat> he would rather that you not perish but have eternal life. He wants you right with him. Give him your heart. Ask him to come into your heart to be your Lord and the Savior. Ask Him to give you power and strength to live for Him and to make those changes that you need to make. You need to make those changes because they're good for you. And God will honor that in your lives.